Welcome back to Capitalism and Art. LGBTQIA plus issues intersected with Black issues intersected with the fuckery of 2020. And I have Dylan Lamu talking about um, Blackness and art and capitalism. Our relationship with Black men has been complex. And I think with my father... I love my father as a child, and I still love my father so much now, but I saw him in his really, really low points as a drunk and a domestic violence uh, and a lot of just things that a child shouldn't see. Um, I grew up in City Park West in Denver, and there was a lot of Black kids I used to play with all the time and had many relationships with many friendships with black kids growing up and then and then kind of transitioning from like that and then going to the philippines and going to high high school in the philippines for half of my freshman year and then coming back to america and going to east high school for two years just surrounded by mainly white women and that wasn't bad and then like i kind of like distanced myself from black men because i would i had an idea that they wouldn't like me or or something but there was a few great cool black friends that i had even during my early times in high school but then meeting you in D- at dsa for during my junior year was really inspiring because yeah we discussed uh scripts and we talked about fiona apple a lot and then we we made then you you wrote dead girls and um from there i think there was other layers of me understanding blackness and especially black men. I think I had to, I didn't really want to date black guys. Well, that's the oh my God. So controversial. Well, no, here's what I did. But this is actually something that's very (laughs) important to discuss because, um, you know, it was like, well, as you know me, it was like happily chronically single, but during the- Are you an incel or- (laughs) 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 Or you're just- (laughs) I just want to be a Chad. Um, there yeah. was just like a My lot of yeah. So, there was just bro. a lot of like it, when I knew you when we were both living in Denver at the same time, and we would like go to like parties and stuff like that. And you had always had this like I always kind of admired that to you, where you kind of had this like gravitas towards not necessarily being uh, very like not 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 necessarily not, not aware. What I want to say is you weren't. Uh, self-conscious is what I want to say about yeah. like being like a black man and maybe not having like not being like the most desirable in the like textbook sense and that didn't right, right. during that you. time especially yeah and that didn't necessarily <laughs> stop you from like both well, pursuing people that you wanted to have some sort of, like romantic inclination with and then there also seemed to be a lot of people who at least you claim to have like approached you in that sort of way um point I want to get to this is that like I don't think any of them were black. I'm not necessarily sure what their whole life background was, but a good portion of them was white. Not to saying that like dating, you know, white guys is bad or anything by any means, but I did want to just like uh, go into, yeah, thinking how exactly like, do you feel as though there was some kind of like self trepidation that like played out as to where you couldn't necessarily look into the eyes of someone who possibly reflected the same pain that you had. Like I know we're getting deep, but like this is what live is. Um, supposed to no, maybe, maybe, but like when I think back to that time when I was like in my early twenties, like my mm-hmm. late teens and early twenties, mm-hmm. um, I was really drunk and high a lot, <laughs> and then also. I was like getting into like Buddhism and not really understanding the concepts and then like practicing it in a way that was like, have you read manifesting? You're being very ordinary. I think you need to read some Alan Watts. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think back at those times, I don't think that what I wasn't dating black men because I was like disgusted or I didn't want to like look into their eyes and see their struggle and like, see how it's so connected and interwoven into mine Mm -hmm. it was just like i was growing up in denver and i didn't there weren't really many gay men on tinder or grinder but i also didn't have a smartphone at the time too 
I had a flip phone, so I wasn't, I was only able to, like, experience life through, like, what my friends are doing and not really, like, <laughs> I wasn't. I had a flip phone, I, a laptop, and, like, I wasn't banned from Leela's coffee shop yet, so, yeah. I mean, I hooked up <laughs> with a few black guys, this one black guy from Puerto Rico, he lived on, like, West Colfax named Roman. Mm-hmm. Like raw 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 mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, but seriously though, but I think I started to uh analyze it more when I moved to New York and then I was like, oh my god, I mean white men are not bad, but when I started dating other like when I when I really started to become intimate, and I don't mean intimate like in a way that's sexual, I just mean intimate like in close proximity with a lot of times. Base definition, yeah. A lot of times. It really helped. Um that really helped just moving out of Denver to experience like, oh, I was kind of missing out on dating black guys. And then like, now I don't date any black guys again, not because of like choice, it's because there's like not many gay black guys here. And the one, never mind, I'm not gonna bring him up. Well, that's the thing, that's <laughs> like, have you, so then have like living in the Philippines, um, what is the dating scene kind of like there where you you know can kind of be seen like as the other even though that you have a direct connection to this country and this culture and this like you know historical like lineage and yet you can still feel kind of like uh Uh, southern yeah um i think so that's so interesting i think with certain partners that i've had one particular um Mm -hmm. He would always, even even though he didn't really have any Filipino blood, really, even, and I have like 50%, like my mother is Filipino, he would always challenge my uh, Asian side a lot. He'd be like, you're not really Filipino. Or there'd be a lot of, even with a lot of guys, I'd be, there's just like a lot of dismissal or like they don't know that I grew up with the same type of foods or mm-hmm. that I, even though I don't speak the language fluently, <laughs> Um, I'm still, uh, I'm still Filipino, and I think there's a lot of dating here. I I've had to like be mindful because it's like dating a. For me, I go in the mindset it's like dating a white guy who's even more oblivious to black, uh, black lives or black culture because they weren't. They're even more separated from it. So I think about it from that mentality of like it's like sort of like a white man, a gay white man, but further removed from Black American culture. Some, like, sometimes it's like that. Not all of it's not all of the guys I've dated here are like that. And I think they've all been, they all were so inspiring and like it helped me write my poem called Black Pepper. <laughs> Can you read this poem? Do you have it on you? Yeah, it's on my medium. <laughs> Sounds so dumb. <laughs> Hold on, I have to turn on my phone first. Other phone. Um, are you talking? What uh, are you talking on right now? How many phones do you have? I have two phones. <laughs> I work on two phones. I make all of my art on two phones right now. It was just like I have two phones because I'm a businessman, CM. Yeah. Hello, Dad. <laughs> just kidding. Um, it's Nokia. I can't really see. Anyway, but yeah, I think my relationship with Black men is good. I think I kind of really, really understood it on a deeper level for me personally, too, besides dating Black men Mm -hmm. and having better relationships with the Black men I knew was writing the character Dom in Dead Musician Fan Club. And like, he is not me. I mean, all those characters are me. I wrote it. But they're it's like they're I, a part of you, but yeah, they're not emblematic in any sense. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And I think with Don, I was feeling that when how how he's written and how the characters perceive him as kind of like sexist or misogynistic or like really inappropriate or like out of base for calling out racism in Denver. Like he, they all live in Denver and they're all like have their own, they're in like a little small friend group and mm-hmm. um, writing him helped me understand how there's a lot of maybe interpersonal communication building within the black community that I needed to personally do still or how I just need to write more black characters or 
I don't know. It was a, that just writing a character like that really helped me understand my. I don't know. It helped me understand a lot in terms of my black identity and also understanding how it relates to. Because you're bringing the, the majority. Sensibility. Yeah, exactly. Huh? Oh, I'm saying yeah. you're bringing the sensibility of aesthetic to like the black experience. And because it is, you know, directly inspired by like some things that you like, you're not trying to make this avatar for your experience, but you definitely want right. to tell these stories that have the people who look like this, who experience these things into something that is not only pleasing to the eye, but also like has some sort of like emotional weight to it. It definitely, um, like I can feel that like do you remember when we oh my god like I think about this a lot do you remember when we both went to go see Moonlight at the Mayan in Denver yeah and then like we were like, <laughs> we were, like going in the lobby waiting for the last like trying to get out and then like all these people come out and I recognize you know this guy that I saw like uh, that I met at like the MCA and then like his girlfriend whatever and and like you know like other people who looks like I can remember like all these interactions that I have with these white people who've been going who went in to see this film and I saw them coming out and they all just kind of gave us this look that was like we don't know whether they like felt sorry for us or wanted to like yeah. to us or like fuck us or kill us or just like all this combination of like this weird stuff. You remember when we did movie movie trivia at the C Film Center and we won and then they gave us 12 Years a Slave book. Yes! Oh my god. <laughs> like, I'm gonna finish my point on this one when we uh, went to go see Moonlight. And then we, yeah. both, like, we both, like, had to pee or something and we were in the restroom and this guy fucking followed us in there and was like, are you guys about to go see Moonlight? It's really good. You'll love it. <laughs> Just kind of like, and then I think I left at that point and then he, like, tried to stay and talk to you. What did he say? Yeah. I think we remember, but I was just like, I'm gonna wash my hands. <laughs> it's kind of weird because it was just like, what exactly do you like want from us now? It's like, oh, here's your here's your one real example to show that you fucking care about the like gay black faggot in its natural habitat, the cinema. In the cinema bathroom stall. Exactly. Right? Oh my god. And I was just like, I can't deal with this right now. But there was yeah. uh, I mean, like, but that's the thing. It was like, and then we both went in, we saw it, it was great. But then, yeah, like, I don't know, it was like, I remember we all, we like both went to go see like Francis Ha together. We went to go like a lot of, just these like, art You never go up to white girls and be like, oh my God, do you feel liberated? Do you feel from liberated? Francis do, you, do you feel, do you feel seen? Are you mobilized? <laughs> are you mobilized? <laughs> oh my God, all of the sheep are like screaming outside. Like that's, because we're, yeah. that's because yeah we're talking some real stuff right now so they can they definitely uh hear us and agree wholeheartedly wow that was a <laughs> murderous streak i think they're getting murdered i mean killed yeah for that's but like that sounds like murder. that's okay they're so cute though Ugh, oh my god how, sim how symbolic is that like we're capricorn we're both capricorns and that those are goats being slaughtered Symbolism. I thought you said they were sheep, and also uh, I remember I have a tail. I can just jump into the fucking river. Whatever. A a sheep turns into a goat once you give it enough like e exp points, and they're like Pokemon card, and they can evolve into goats. Oh man! Hopefully that. Uh... Silence of the lambs too. <laughs> <laughs> the goats. They were screaming. They were screaming. <laughs> um, Dylan Locke, uh, do you think that with, with whatever work you publish next, it's going to receive any sort of acclaim or change because it's a Black artist? You're a certified Black artist? Or do you think that it'll I don't be know, the I guess same? It really depends on the kind of story that I tell and whether or not people connect with it. Like, I hope that yeah. they do, but I'm going to do it whether or not that connection is facilitated because, you know, that, that's not the important part about it, I'm sure, as you know. Yeah, um, but, but I mean, like, the, the goal is, like, you hopefully want to connect with people. It's, it's the connection that's the focus, not the acclaim. Yeah, I think that, like, even the two or three to five connections that I've made from Dead Musician Fan Club, is profound to me like how people 
Like, what those, um, I, I'm, I'm very interested because you never told me about those like connections. Like, have black people kind of like come up to you and been like, "Oh my god, I love this movie because of mm, you know X X." Not X. necessarily people that are black. Uh-huh. They're mostly not. None of them have been black. This is my film. I think mm-hmm. the black people in the film, in front of the screen and behind the scenes, uh, really love the film. And they were able to, when like we were creating it, we're always, we were like when we were collaborating and we were making a movie, we're always like talking about why this is important, why, like, or contextualizing it kind of before you start shooting it sometimes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think the, those are profound connections I've made is through the collaborations I've made versus the exhibitions, which is like, I have no complaints over that. I mean, there's like a 20 year old, like a, a younger Andy, ten year, ten years ago, Andy, that would be like kind of like be pissed about like having the collaborations be be the more meaningful thing than what happened after it was distributed. Um, I think for me now, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, a writer, an actor, whatever, like yeah, I just think it's like the connections from collaboration and through people who watch the film, well, however small or big that is, it's super profound. Like, you only need like one person in the room to believe in you out of a hundred people in the room. And if that one person believes in you, in you, you're okay, you know? Lady Gaga said that. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> amazing, groundbreaking, spell, spell, yeah, spell binding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, Giovanni's room will be fun to make because, like, honestly, I've been in those types of rooms. Do you have any dream casting for Giovanni's room? Not yet. I want to just, like, do more research on... Like, real I have talk, to reread like, the book again. Michael B. Jordan should do some gay shit. He should go full broke back and do your version of Giovanni's room. Yeah, because I realized, too, like, because I was something that was kind of bothering me with Giovanni's room is, like, how all the characters... I mean, it's not a bad thing at all. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I think it'd be better if it wasn't like an all white cast or it should be like, it should just be cast based off of who's. Like David is apparently white in it. Like I always, when I read the book, I thought he was black. Like that's the thing though. It was just like, I I feel like, but that was purposeful on Doom 12 in part because we all know that this guy is black. Like the whole new thing about him being like other is the fact that he's like an American, like, um, you know, expert or whatever. And he's like in foreign land or whatever. But like, it's obviously a metaphor for being black, even if technically within the story he is like in Italy or no, I'm sorry, in France and he's dating um, this Italian, the eponymous Giovanni. And I was thinking to myself, it was like, like we all know what that is, but it's just because it was, you know, so controversial. I think that was Bruce Will on his part, was to he kind of like left that uh, somewhat ambiguous. Yeah, because I felt it as ambiguous. I know from like reading it the first time, I was just picturing um, David to be, I have like someone like, I can't think of any actor besides the actors who played her who's the lead in Dear White People. Like a little bit like kind of like nerdy, but like really like Oh, uh, the guy worldly who plays the idol. Yeah. hmm And then for his girlfriend who's in Spain, Hedda, someone like Zendaya, I'm just kidding. Or someone <laughs> like who has that type of star power by the time you know, we get to filming that or whatever. But yeah, I think that's a beautiful film. And I think that I hope I'm able to direct that film or ad- adapt that book because I wouldn't, I would feel so, that for me would be like the weirdest thing to see someone else adapt and like make into a movie, no matter how great they are, because I really love that project so much. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like, like, it's like the impetus of, like, you know, being your own Sofia Coppola and adapting the version Suicides, even though, you know, someone's probably purchased the film rights or whatever, like, you still have yeah. to put your own, like, vision out there because people might, yeah, they might just be like, wait a minute, this is way better. Why did we ever think that this person could tell this story when you were so clearly apt to do that? I have faith in I you. I think that, that you're, 
I, yeah, I think that you are going, I have much faith in you. I feel like Giovanni's room is going to be one of your heralded masterpieces. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> That's really yeah. so <laughs> I feel like I was like, oh my God, that was like the way like I don't even know how to process that because that's beyond I'm that's really wonderful to hear like and all of your work that you've done is so amazing too and I feel like there's not much celebration between two working black artists and just celebrating each other's work I mean that that those type of videos need to be seen more and that's what's happening right now if you don't know Dylan can you tell them where they can find your work like the web yes. that I actually just uh, updated my site today. So you can find my work on craigmontyjames.com. Andy has been calling me Dylan this entire time. I do make work under a pseudonym uh, named CM James, standing for Craig Monty James, which is a name that I just mm. came up with when I was 16 because I was posting shit on the internet and I didn't want certain people to find it. So I had to use an alias. And since then it has, no, I'm kind of creating my own narrative and while like it's not like i hate my name or anything but i don't know i feel like i'm definitely the captain of my own ship when i make things under that because it was just like this is who i am presenting myself as an artist in totality and that even includes the way i am to be like addressed like you know the people who i know and i'm friends with can call me dylan or whatever but like this is kind of separate to that even though it is definitely inspired a lot by my own life it has a lot to do with then kind of separating that and then putting it into the work which should just speak for itself the part of my identity shouldn't be any part of like my physical identity shouldn't be associated with that at all unless it is like within that work and if it's strong enough then it's explicit enough to where you can you know uh discern that so that's why I use CM James. James. You can find myself on craigmontyjames.com. I also do have a Tumblr, as Andy mentioned, Wallflower Manifesto, but I haven't updated it. Uh, like I, I lurk on there to like check the comments and stuff like that because there is still some Tumblr discourse that is very much alive and well that I like to uh, witness in real time, but I don't update that site anymore just because I consider it a complete archive of the things that have inspired me like since then from 2011 to 2019 like it's a new decade so I don't feel any need to really like put stuff on that anymore I have a website for it now I feel that um what um what are you writing right now are you writing any uh, right now I am writing a yes tv series um, like a la Bekela Cole style where I am s the sole author of several episodes. It's been, um, you know, as Clara Boucher once put, you know, her working process equally enjoyable and torturous, but I also am working, uh, well, I am still working on, you know, my, uh, I, I don't know how well known we are at this point in our circle of friends, but like my diaries where I have um, just basically like a portion of like media that I will consume, but then I will just put it, you know, into this journal and then I'll write it. But, you know, so many things have been like so many things have been uh, entered in here. Like this is from like an L magazine shoot. Uh, this was from a book on um like hippies and culture and what have you this was specifically from like a book on uh like yoko ono and i guess like subversive art and then this was from a vice magazine photo issue like it's definitely something that's been like very um like yeah it's, it's been important to me there there are several of these diaries and this is the first time they've actually included original work too like because a lot of the photos that are original work. Let's see if I can find another one. I mean, like, I also include original drawings in there. Um, but then it also, like, has a lot of stuff as to where I'm just, like, I don't know. It, 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 it has, like, that's an original photo when I went to go see Arca um, DJ with Shane Oliver, who is a designer for a label put by Air. He worked with Helmut Lang for a little bit. Um, <laughs> those are the characters of Daria as millennials, but like I don't know. It has a lot of. It's a beautiful collage diary book. 
Thank you. Have you ever thought about doing like a photo book? I've been thinking about doing photo books, and like maybe as like a side, not a side thing, but like like maybe within the next couple of months. Like, I want to do. I mean, I have been compiling photos of like Pinoy guys, like Filipino guys here, and like doing like a, a photo. Like book wait, book like an imaginary book. boyfriend's redo. I mean, I never. I mean, honestly, like I have now at this point in June 2020, I've dated like so many guys that are now technically imaginary boyfriends but at the time <laughs> where we were taking a couple photos like i mean i can't use those i don't want to use those photos because that's like those are real personal it's like my from for me but yeah like <laughs> yes so yeah okay going. i'm listening Sorry, so i, I just had to go to back to i just had to go back to my uh photos and what was it tell you about essex hemp hill um what was it? Essex is actually was featured in Tongues Untied as well. He was on the poster of Tongues with Marlon Riggs. So you know the like the photo of like the two black guys hugging? Mm. That's Marlon and then that's Essex right behind him. People thought that they were lovers and then were so disappointed when they found out that um Marlon's uh, partner was white because they were just like, this is a sham, like, how can you possibly do this? And then they just completely, like, I don't know, people just, like, ignored as example because he was an American poet, activist, known for his contributions, like, to the Washington, D.C., like, art scene in the 80s and that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of his stuff wasn't published until, like, or a lot of his stuff was, like, posthumously published um because it was just like too black and too gay for middle america you know even if it was through like poetry chapbooks and something like that he mm -hmm. like definitely uh i feel like is at the forefront of that and was just talking about like also being like a sex worker within his work and it has a lot uh of weight to it that i feel like you should <laughs> and this is marlon riggs and this is marlon riggs um, not marlon riggs this is essex hemp hill who was featured in in tons of Diet. Yes. Got it. Question. Um, which David Lynch film has inspired you the most? Actually, actually, um, weirdly enough, a I know a lot of people who know me will probably be like, this bitch is about to say, uh, what was it, Mulholland Drive? <laughs> I know you weren't going to say that because you kept saying, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, because, I knew yeah. you had like a change but... of thought or something. <laughs> But um, the film, the David Lynch film that's inspired me most is actually Fire Walk With Me. Because at the, it's very hard. It is a story about kind of uh, overcoming a trauma and ascending that to become something uh, a little bit more divine in your eyes. Like the last shot of Fire Walk With Me is uh, Laura Palmer in, not not heaven, but you know, she's like in the uh, the, Black Lodge or whatever, right? Oh. Like in the after life. And she's uh, looking at this like TV screen and it doesn't show you what it shows on there. But um, a lot of, you know, theorists have been like, she's actually watching like the show Twin Peaks is like this recap of her life. And she's observing all these like crazy characters and everything like that. And this angel's watching over her and she's just like looking up into this blinding white light, just like smiling deliriously. And it also kind of like this uh, physical representation of ecstasy and like, going through just like so much shit and then just coming out of it just being like okay now that I have you know um, and smart. she can only kind of you know as Laura Palmer can only kind of ascend that after she's died and now it's just kind of like seeing all these things like just like played out in front of her and like putting all of these pieces together and I feel like you can only really do that yourself especially after you uh feel as though you've inherited trauma or you experienced it that you can only see in retrospect these certain things as to where you actually can be proud of yourself because you have kind of made these steps yourself to become a better person in a way. So it's a very convoluted, slightly like confusing interpretation of that movie. But you know, I've always like loved Twin Peaks too, and that soundtrack slaps like fucking shit. So yeah, do you know what my favorite David Lynch film or what inspires me the most? Uh, Lost Highway. No. <laughs> I love that movie though. Oh, I no, do no, love that movie. No, though. Inland Empire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That is the David Lynch film out of all of them that has this like. I love Laura Dern. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but 
She should have won an Oscar for that. Like, I haven't seen Marriage Story yet. Or haven't finished it yet, but I, I love Laura Dern in Inland Empire. Mm-hmm. I love that breakdown. I love all the breakdowns. I like seeing an actress, like, break down in public For three <laughs> hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, speaking of which, I actually watched, um, uh, um, Oh my God! What's it called? Um, the woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Cassavetes. I watched that for the first time. I had never seen oh Gina Rollins in that performance that before, and yeah. it was fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I, the last time I saw that was in New York with Brittany Vickers, and then she really got into John Cassavetes' work after that. But I mean, Gina Rollins' performance in um, a woman on the verge of a mental break or woman on the verge mm-hmm. of a nervous um, breakdown. Yeah. That is a perfect performance showing psychosis. And then, like, mm-hmm. how, like, you know, she was in circumstances with her husband who's, like, kind of being, he's agitating her, he's kind of aggressive and violent towards her. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Like, no, no, no. It's not, it's not Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Fuck. No, that's, um, that's on Maldivar. Fuck. What is this called? Um, Woman Under the Influence. A Woman Under the Influence. <laughs> oh, my God. We know, our, we know we know our, our films. <laughs> <laughs> um, that film captures psychosis and mania so well because mm. it like shows you because it shows you kind of like beforehand like okay she's kind of like not doing well and then like the external factors in her life like her husband and having a lot of kids and having a lot of shit to take care of and like just like the daily things of life <laughs> And then not really like kind of checking in will lead you to get that way. Like when I watched that movie, I was just like, holy shit. Like, comfortable being under like, well, they don't, they haven't done this since like what the fucking 40s or something, but not necessarily being under a contract with the studio, but like, how. They still do that you... here. Oh, there? Like old, old Hollywood style, like where you have like a five year contract or a four picture deal, deal five picture deal with a like production ABS, CBN, or Viva Films. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to talk to you about, so um, there was a show that you had a little part on. How exactly did that come to be? My, uh, my part for- Your screen debut. My screen debut. Oh my God, what a fun time. (laughs) 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 The first time I was on camera. I can also talk about wage disparity within that. Yes, please but, do. I'm, I'm go, very curious. It's like, did you get paid? Did the other, did the whiter extras get paid? Like, how many? I mean, and you even had I'll, a speaking role. So, like, how do they yeah, delay I'll explain, for that? I'll explain yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, so, what happened? So, I auditioned, and then me and my boyfriend at the time were like, what was the audition fun. like? It, there was like a lot of, there was a lot of white males auditioning for the same role as me as an FBI agent so as a speaking role and as you get more money uh-huh. and I was just like in my head I was just like you know like I was just thinking in my head like colorism is so fucking real here like <laughs> these some of these white guys are probably half Filipino or a quarter Filipino and like they're way like they're like really really well built like they look like like really muscular and like that that type for the part of an FBI agent there was also, and so I was just like waiting around, filling out paperwork, and then I auditioned. And they're like, I was like, oh my god, I have to like. And this just sounds really bad, but like <laughs> I realized that like my speaking voice is like a very girly valley. It's like a valley girl type of accent, and it's very like gay and light and friendly. And so I was just like in my head when I was memorizing lines before the audition, I was like, I have to be like, bro, 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 shut up, bro, you just great. Yeah, this is like positions in command. I saw that clip. You're very butch. Yeah, people like don't even. <laughs> yeah, because I had to be because that's what was. Because <laughs> they kept Positions telling me. In command, hunty. Open your oh, ears and surrender. Side side note. I know this is jumping ahead, but I felt at one point like Bill Murray in Lost in Translation for during his uh, whiskey commercial, like the way that. Yes, and <laughs> because they were like, Emmy, be more aggressive. And I was like, I literally drink like five cups of coffee and a Red Bull. Like, what the fuck? How extra, how like extroverted do I need to be? Roger Moore? 
All right, all right, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> so the Filipino extras that are there way longer, I work each day for 15 to 16 hours per day. And how many days of the shoot was it? I only had to be there for three days. Okay. And I got paid. And so, for example, I get paid 8,888 pesos. And then the extras only get paid, even if they have speaking lines and they're doing choreography, it's only 500 per day. So I but made 8,888. Your, you were... Uh, given a set amount of money for this role, which was over eight thousand. Per 000. day, yeah. Oh, wait, you got over eight thousand per day. Eight thousand eight hundred eighty-eight pesos, pesos, not U.S. dollars per day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And but, how much is that in U.S. dollars? Do you know? I don't know. I have to divide it by fifty. <laughs> <laughs> but the so, the people okay. on set, behind the scenes, and in front of the camera longer than me we're getting mm -hmm. on average 500 per day working more hours and I so for example if I make 8,888 times two what is so 8,888 uh, Filipino pesos equals 178 US dollars about yeah and then what is 500 divided by 50? What is 500 divided by 50, you said? Yeah. Is it uh, it's $50? 10. Oh, it's no, 10? 10. Yeah, so they, people would make $10 per day, and they would have to work more days. They would have to work a month or something in order to make the amount that I made in just two days. Wow. And that's the privilege Holy of being shit. American. And even it's weird to like be like, oh, and these are the privileges they have to like actually recognize too. Yeah. Yeah. And like not many people, a Filipino, I mean, there are Filipino people who've done this, but who have gone to America and like make movies there. But it's very rare for a Filipino to do that. Like, I'm, like someone similar to my own age and background. Occasionally, just to go to a foreign country and then like start making a movie about the country that they're in it's uh and like it's very like it's kind of a honestly another privilege because i've been able to go into different networking events meetings and get my film kick-started into production whereas there's many people here who have scripts that don't ever get to see the light of day and mm. or get to even get made or produced so there's a lot of privileges that i needed to check as because uh, even though like i'm it's really 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 fractured so can I, I don't know if i'm going to explain this correctly but let me try so being an american there's an advantage because you have the privilege of your wealth compared to the wealth of a foreign country and this foreign country that i'm a part of colonized the country after the spaniards did but the people who are in power and doing that were not black. Mm. Um, and I'm also part of the colonized. I have, I'm part of Filipino and part American, black American. And it's like, there's like a weird dynamic and privilege. And there's a lot of things that I have privilege over that a lot of times people who are from here born and raised don't have the same luxury so there's like weird things that i have to consider too and checking my own privilege in that aspect like and, but it's also like colorism is also very much uh an issue here and the centering of whiteness is still a thing here and i'm not going to be cast right now at least, as like the lead male in the rom-coms here like even if I speak fluent Tagalog or fluent Messiah, I'm not going to be. It's like, if you don't look like Henry Golding, I don't want to fucking hear it. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Like, or yeah. yeah. But he's like way hotter. <laughs> Sorry. Like, I, I just like remember. It's like objectively of any race. If you put Henry Golding it, in any sort of skin tone, you would say. His, like, objectively his smile. That smile. Oh my God. <laughs> you, I forgot about him, but now I'm remembering <laughs> Anyway, um, 
yeah capitalism is so bad and like ew it is really bad i mean and it's and i'm very fortunate bad, enough but then also like if we are living in this uh status to where you like need to be paid for your work properly then you need to be paid for your work like i'm sorry this yeah. is like you know, running a show directing a film like we can't like marlon riggs made tongues untied on five thousand dollars right right and and yeah and it was like and it's you know it's like and people also can to make great videos for much less than that that's been the great uh thing about technology is that it's kind of democratized filmmaking in a way as to where you may not have the best tools but you do have tools to make a movie and exactly you know exactly. and then, and but then there's also the thing but about then, well how are you going to market it or distribute it or yeah. anything like that you and like who is actually going to see it because that doesn't necessarily take away from the actual strength of the work itself. The story. Um, right. Yeah. It's just like, where, like, how do you get people to actually see this and care? Does that even matter in the end? Like, I just I, want to add to that too, really quickly, because that's super important. I feel like no matter what happens in society, whether it's going to benefit all people in a bit more equi um, equitable way, it's so important to utilize the tools that you have and be resourceful, even if you're not getting resources or funding or acknowledgement from the institutions that you work in or like the art institution you work in or like the whatever, is to continue to make your work because no one can stop you from making the work. Mm -hmm. And that's the most powerful thing is the work itself. And then, you know, distribution and everything that falls after, like, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to, it's like secondary in a sense, because I just like the, the creating of the work and the knowledge you gain from making a new project. And then who, you, and I know at least one person will see the work or at least two people will see the work. And if it's properly archived, I know, YouTube, for some reason, is, I think, a very, at this point in time, a very good way to archive your work, because people can see it from, for decades and decades. It's like a great tool, but I don't know if that's going to be sustained. I don't know how that's sustained or how it's going to be sustained. Because you're but, putting it in someone else's database, essentially. It's not something that you made yourself. You're just hoping yeah. it's there. Yeah, so in the end, I think, no matter what system we're in, or they're in our, like, authoritarian, dictative rule or anything, like, I mean, those play a capacity into how things are made. And so does capitalism. But we still are at a point in time right now where we can create vital pieces of work. Mm. And people will see the work no matter what. At this point. I mean, maybe not, but even if not, even if they don't, you can still show it to people firsthand. Or you can still, True. there's so well, many ways. You to had your, uh, what was it, Dead Musician Fan Club? The premiere was at Mutiny Cafe, I believe. Yeah, we premiered there. And it was actually. Very and did you just good. like talk to people there who were like, I want to show my film? Can I do this? Like, how, how did you get to premiere your film? I went to the owners and I was like, oh my God, I love your beard. <laughs> <laughs> You just pulled a straight Kesha, great, yeah. No, I could have, but I don't, I mean, no, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to. Or anyway, um, but yeah, like just going and in, going into places where you're like, you, you hear about people screening at places or you hear, there's a lot of resources as an artist to showcase your work. It might not be in a movie theater and it might not be in a film festival, but you can still have great conversation and audience engagement physically. Mm -hmm. It's just all about like looking into the spaces in your area. If you are wanting to do that type of work, if you're wanting to screen your work to public without using the conventional means of submitting to without a box, which is now closed, so to film freeway. So there's a lot of different ways to distribute your work. And for me, I use a combination of spamming and asking questions. So to close our talk with our final statements, um, I think I wish in this current time is that uh, we all see our potential. We all be our own Shamika. 
Sure, and sure. we uh, have enough confidence to both not only pursue our dreams, but then actively um, just kind of check in with one another and realize that there are spaces for all of us. It's not just necessarily who's going to be, you know, the next marginal voice to be amplified. There are many stories, you know. I felt mm -hmm. very alienated early on in high school, feeling as though I was other than that particular sense, but there are so many, like, the whole, whole like, creative black femme boys whatever like we exist en masse and that's like very apparent like I have discovered that through both like not only like living in the city but then like uh, just having uh, being very involved in like looking into the lives of like other people like especially like on the internet who like want to broadcast that and you know makes it realize that you know your point of view is not alone and because there are other people who you know have similar visions to you that doesn't diminish your own in fact that should empower you because that means that you're like speaking the fucking truth and that your life is something that is both like experienced witnessed heard and uh can be celebrated. and we are at the 24 second mark 24 seconds whatever okay what do you say um i agree with dylan i think that there's so many voices and they will be heard they don't necessarily have to be amplified for them to be heard through a, a white median a mediator oh anyways black lives matter black art matters